Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the meet and greet at Dartmouth. My name is Melina Gehring. I'm the multilingual specialist at Dartmouth College, and I'm also your international graduate student advisor. And I would like to introduce you to um, two of your future fellow students. Um, well, I'm saying future because you will start being a student in fall, but they have been students here for quite some time. So this is Jin Qing. She's the president of the Chinese Students Scholar Association. And this is Pin Hao or Andy, and he is a co-chair of the International Graduate Mentoring Program. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for um, joining us. <laughs> So the thing, uh, the thing is, um, a couple of words about how this works. Um, I've decided to um, give you a chance to remain anonymous so that you can um, ask your questions via chat and just feel free to ask anything. And actually, someone is currently uh, sharing a video, so I would ask you not to share a video or um, audio and just remain anonymous. If you look to the top right corner of your screen, um, there is the chat window. Whenever you have questions, please type your question into the chat. If you couldn't quite understand something that um, any of us just said, and you quickly want to interject and say, hey, could you please repeat that? You have the option to press your space bar and keep it pressed and speak to us. So pressing the space bar unmutes your microphone for the time you're pressing it. But please only resource that option to um, just briefly ask something for like real questions. Please go in the chat window and ask them there. Um, and ask them at any point in the presentation. We might finish our thought before we come to the question, but we'll try to um, uh, answer as many questions as possible. Okay, so let's pre quickly look at um, the structure of um, the talk. So um, at the beginning of the meeting, I will give um, Pin Hao and Jing Qing a chance to um, speak about who they are and what they do for international graduate students on campus. Then I'll say a little bit about um, what my role is in that respect. And then we um, will look at acculturation, uh, getting adapted to life in the US, we will um, have a look at Dartmouth campus and how to familiarize yourselves uh, with Dartmouth, uh, life in Hanover, life in the US in general, practical issues. And then at the end of the session, I will talk a little bit about writing and communication support because that's what I mainly offer on campus. Okay, so let's first go to, um, I would say, Jing Qing and say a little bit about who you are and what you do at CSSA. Sure. Hi guys, uh, my name is Xin Jing Xi. I'm a first year Mao student and now the president of the Dumbass Chinese Students and Scholars Association, uh, which is short for CSSA. Uh, okay, CSSA is an official organization that registered in most uh, college and universities outside of China and provide help to the Chinese students and scholars in their life, study and work. Here in Denmark, we uh, help with the communication, friendship, and academic promotion in the Chinese community. And uh, we also help build up a good relationship with other Ch uh, Ivy League universities. Okay, we, uh, like we have events uh, such as uh, Chinese traditional festival celebrations, uh, we have uh, some sports competitions, some traveling, some parties. And another uh, purpose of CSSA is to enhance the communication of Chinese culture and other cultures. So uh, we welcome all the students in Dumas to our events. Thank you. Thanks, Jing Jing. So Andy, what does I, uh, who, who are you, first of all, and then what does IGMP do for international students? Um, hi everybody. Um, so I'm Pin Hao Chen, and you can also call me Andy as well. It's easy to remember in that way. Uh, I'm the f going to be the fifth uh, uh, year uh, PhD student at the um, Department of Psychological and Brain Science, and I'm the co-chair, um, new co-chair um, in uh, IGMP. So IGMP is a place for um, welcoming all the graduate student, international graduate student to. Um, to be on the campus 
and then we all with the main purpose of our organization is to help uh, international students to settle up and adjust in this new uh, environment and new culture. So we the first, the biggest event for us is to uh, find a mentor uh, for you guys. So later in like maybe two weeks later, you will know your mentor. Everybody will have two mentors. Um, international, they are either international students at Dartmouth or they are American students here. Uh, but they are very familiar with the life here. So you can ask them about uh, any kind of question, especially your like life or any kind of like um, any kind of like a question you have uh, before you come, you can you can contact with them and then they can help you on um, this way. And later we will have a lot of like social events, just like Jing Jing, we have a lot of parties and also a lot of like social events. So welcome everybody to join us. And just don't hesitate to let me know about uh, if you have any kind of question or let your mentor know whether you have any questions. So the purpose of us is to help you to adjust here and welcome you guys. At Thanks, Andy and Jing Jing. So if anyone already has any questions about ITMP or CSSA or personal questions to these two guys, please type them into your little chat window and um, we'll uh, answer those questions. So um, I am, my primary role at Dartmouth as being the multilingual specialist, which means that I work um, with people on their uh, writing skills and presentation skills. But I'm also uh, the International Graduate Student Advisor, which means that you can come to me with any questions that are not visa related. So if you have visa questions, you would go to OVIS, the Office for Visa and Immigration Services. Um, with anything else, you can always come to me or, uh, as a matter of fact, also to my colleagues at the Graduate Office. Um, so I, I can help you with cultural adaptation issues. If for some reason um, it's difficult adjusting to life in the US for the first uh, weeks or months that you're here, I'm also happy to help with academic and cultural communication challenges. Um, academia is a quite global business, but there are still um, quite some cultural differences, how things are done um, across the globe. And I might be able to um, explain a little bit uh, why communication with your PhD advisor is not uh, working the way it should be. Um, we can also talk about um, classroom culture. Uh, I studied in the UK for a while and um, things were quite different there. I also studied in my um, home country in Germany and um, I've experienced myself um, how different people behave in classrooms in different countries. So, for example, in uh, in the UK, um, the British and international students were usually making fun of American students for always participating in class, like always. Like, the professor asked any questions and the American students were like mm -hmm. on top of it, right? So, that's obviously um, a very American trait. When you sit in a classroom, you know, you always want to apply yourself and participate. What it means for you when you come to America and you're from a culture where, you know, it might not be um, appreciated if you always uh, voice your opinion and always participate at any point, you might be inhibited to do that. The problem is that your American professor or PhD advisor or master thesis advisor might think that you're shy and that, you know, um, uh, we, you might not be interested in the topic and that you uh, don't show initiative and they might criticize you for something that is not part of your personality or doesn't say anything about your academic um, capabilities. It's just something that is cultural. So I think it's very important to address these topics and have a dialogue about um, how do Americans perceive me and how can I adapt in my professional demeanor so that I can, you know, meet their needs. And I will actually be um, offering some workshops on that, but we can always also have one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and then finally, I'm also uh, dedicated to improving so social life and cooperating with uh, CSSA and IGMP and offering stuff on behalf of the graduate office just so that you feel um, welcome at Dartmouth and integrated into campus culture. Okay, so let's look a little bit at acculturation and um, 
I'm sharing this. So one second, guys, I want to go to uh, my slideshow. Bear with me, sorry about that. I just want to show you some slides about acculturation. Here we go. Lake there. there is a bit of a lag, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, quite yeah. quite a drastic lag. Yeah. Sorry, guys, you're you know you kind of see it from your end. Um, when I click a button, it you know it takes like 20 seconds until <laughs> the uh, the slide shows up. But we'll we'll be dealing with that for patient people. Okay, so I would ask Andy, who actually studies it for studies acculturation for his PhD to explain a little bit what it will be like for you to come to Dartmouth and be in this new cultural environment, and then what? Okay. <laughs> yeah, listen, this will be a long journey for you guys. Um, just like me, I stay here for four years. So most of this, the stage you, sh you see on the slides, I experience all of them. So um, don't worry about too much right now, because right now I know, like most of you, are very excited about a new beginning a new life here, and that's very normal. So this is what we call the honeymoon uh, stage. Um, it happens when when you starting from now to like first couple of months when you stay in here, but things might change a little bit later because um, you know, like when something new is coming and something like a lot of like new things coming, you will be very excited, but later you were a little bit cooling down and um, there will be the time when you feel like, oh, dude, I'm in a the, in the new country right now. And it's very, very different from how it used to be. And there will be the time when you can see that the crisis stage will come up. So that is very normal. You feel a little bit down and then down and down and down. Don't worry too much about this, but I mean, if you feel in that way, you can seek for the help. If you feel like you can control for that, you can seek for the help. We have, we have a lot of helps on the campus to help you to adjust your mood. But the most important thing is that you need to find some like, um, um, you know, some reliable people or like your friends to make more social uh, kind of events coming up at that stage. And there will be our job and also Jinjin's job as well to help you to go through this st crisis stage. And um, you can see like after the very part, the, the lowest part, you will become better and better. But you are coming back and forth, especially when you go back to your um, home country, because like that is the that is the place you are familiar with. But when you come back, there will be a huge contrast between these two uh, experiences. There will be the time you will go down a little bit again. But don't worry about that, because this is normal. And you will gradually become like used to this kind of like cultural kind of like swing back and forth. And there will be the time when you're going smoothly to the adaptation. Should we go to the next slide, yeah. Andy? And, and um, the key part, um, so maybe we, we need to wait a little bit, but um, it's a lot of <laughs> there, Sorry, guys, there's still the lag. Here we go. No, but we can start this. <laughs> Um, so, based on the most prominent um, acculturation model, there will be two factors there. And the first one is that um, based on these two factors, you will have different kind of outcomes for the acculturation. But I'm saying this is a, this is a long term thing. This might happen like across like a couple years to go to this kind of stage. So don't worry about this right now. I just let you know like what will happen to you. But uh, there are two factors here. One is that to maintain your home culture and identity. The second thing is that developing relationship with the host culture. So based on the lot of research already show, like if you can still maintain your home culture and identity and also developing the host culture, this will be the best. It's like long-term good for your health, good for your social status, good for your money, what you are going to earn in the US. And But a lot of people will think like, what if I come to America, I should become America. I should uh, do and speak and eat as the same way as they are going to do. Try not to be that kind of extremes because that, will, that is the, the ones we call here, like uh, you can see the right top um, corner of the four columns there is called assimilation. And this one is not really good in the long run because you are really hard to uh, you, you try very hard to adjust yourself to that. And that is really uh, mentally 
fatigue for you. Um, so I would say come here and um, try to find a balance between uh, maintain your like identity, like go hang out with your friends, but also try to like uh, do something with your American fellows. And this will be the balance um, to for your to good uh, for your long run to keep the balance between these two. And this will be uh, not just our job, but also Mandina's job and also Jinjin's job, like to help you guys to find a balance. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do you guys have any questions to Andy about uh, the different stages that you will probably, based on uh, psychological research that you would be going through, or um, maybe also a, a personal advice or personal background? So please type them into your yeah. uh, chat. You maybe, yeah, just just ask them anything. That's why they're here. Right. They can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> At least for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, do you have anything to share about this, Jing Jing? Did you experience um, something similar or maybe friends of yours? Uh, sure. I think I have experienced what Andy has talked about. Because when I come here, like I didn't find a good balance of the American culture and my own culture. Because I was the person that you said who is shy to everything, to friends, to professors. And like it's really hard to um, get used to the things here. Like if you are shy in the classes that you don't ask questions, you don't participate in, in, discuss, in discussions, okay, the professor gonna say you are not ready for the uh, what he or she asked you to read. You cannot, you might not understand what uh, he's talking about and he might have a like bad, uh, not bad, just negative uh, impression of you. Like, oh, in the first term I got a low pass, oh my god, for one of the courses because I didn't talk, uh, talk that much in the classes and like only ask one or two questions during a class um but and when i see the grade oh my god because i really prepared a long time before each class for the reading materials and after that that i talked to professors i talked to my friends uh, uh most american friends like what do they behave and how do they prepare for the classes and and later I get better in the later courses and began to uh, communicate with the professors, not only in class, but also in their office hours. That helps a lot. Like they can not only give you suggestions for the class, but also suggestions for other things like writing the life in demos. And that's really helpful. I, I think if you, especially girls, <laughs> In, especially girls in Asian countries, don't be mm -hmm. shy. Just, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, of course you need a time. You need some time, some period to get used to the environment here. But don't be shy. Nope. Just, just talk. Nope. Just, uh, just learn to behave like an American <laughs> student. Yes. <laughs> I think that's great advice, Jing Jing. Um, yeah, I also think it's really good that you mentioned office hours. Um, if you um, graduated from a university in your home country that is really big and really anonymous, like I did, I went to the University of Hamburg, which is a huge mass university, and they don't have much money, which means that classes are big and your professor might not necessarily know your name. Um, if we wanted to go see a professor, we had to sign up in a sheet and uh, for like an appointment in three weeks from now, and then you would be sitting on the floor in the hallway and wait for your turn, and you might have like five to 10 minutes. And here it's very, very different. Um, the student-teacher ratio is great, especially if you're a grad student. You have a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with your professor or advisor. So um, if you're a PhD student in the first two, two years, um, you will be having uh, a lot of coursework. If you're a master's student, then you have courses all over the place anyway. Um, you're highly encouraged to go see your professor on a very regular basis. 
and you will not be limited to five or ten minutes. If you come prepared, if we bring a lot of good uh, questions, then you will have um, a lot of um, really valuable one-on-one -on -one time with your professor. So make use of that. That is one of the uh, really important key factors of um, having the privilege to study at an Ivy League institution is that um, you have so many people who are a resource for you. Also people like myself or librarians um, or other resources who will just be willing to sit down with you and chat for an hour. You know, where else do you have that? So uh, make use of that. So we actually have uh, two great questions in our chat window. And the first one I guess is for Andy. Um, so our guest um, is asking, how long do you feel international students take to adapt in the U.S.? So <laughs> this is a great question. Um, it varies. So I would say like we still don't know. Like a lot of literature try to figure out like who will adapt better, um, try to predict that, but there's no really consensus so far. So it really varies across people, and my suggestion will be saying like don't push yourself too hard for myself because it very across and for myself i think the first year for me really take a lot of time to get used to what they are what they are really americans are really talking about a lot of time is really mentally consuming because you need to adapt to their speed and different people have different kind of like um, uh, pronunciation and it takes a lot of time. So at that moment, you probably don't notice that. Um, so I would say it might take one year to get used to the American culture. And after that, you can, you will start to think about like, that's very, like very unconscious, like the way like you try to put these two things together. But I would say, like, take time. It takes times. Usually, it take a couple of years to find a more stable kind of like a balanced way. And for me, I think right now it's more stable. But it really like what I say, like, it take me four years um, to to I have uh, right now. So um, I would say like it might take a couple months. Um, for some people, they are better to adapt. And if you have like a previous like a uh, uh, foreign cultures uh, exposure experience, then that will be faster for you. But if you don't have that, don't push yourself too hard. Um, it might take years, and try to find a balance between your um, your, your host. I'm I'm saying like to find your friends from the same culture because that is your security base. Don't ignore that. But also try because the, the way why you want to be um, in America is that you want to learn something new. So don't hesitate to hang out with Americans, even you think they are stupid in some way. Oh, no, I'm, sorry. I'm just kidding. But try to find a balance between these two, and then don't push your heart. If you can find a balance, then that's fine. You can you can you can go somewhere. Uh, you don't have to stay in the U.S. forever. Um, just don't push yourself too hard. That's my only suggestion. And it takes time. It varies. Thanks, Andy. So there is actually a follow-up question, I, but I think we can both cover that. So Andy mentioned life, um, life advising or life advisors for international students. Can you elaborate more? How do master students contact with a life advisor and to ask questions about campus life? Um, I'm thinking it depends either at Dick's house or someone in the granite office, or yeah. did, were you thinking of some additional resource? Right. Um, Manila will be good, a good yeah. resource here as well. So, <laughs> yeah, let me take over then. So I would say if you want to find out more about campus life um, and um, all the things that pertain to, oh my gosh, I'm an international student, I need to understand how things work in American academia, how things work at Dartmouth, um, just come to me and have a chat with me. Um, if things are more serious and you think you, you're depressed, um, then there is another great resource open to all Dartmouth students. It's called Dick's House. I'm typing it in the chat window here, Dick's House. And that's where you can go with any illness. Like if you have the flu, you would go there. You would even get your flu shots there to pre prevent um, actually contracting the flu, and they have um, counselors, psychologists, 
who will um, offer advising and it comes for free. So that's a great resource. Um, you should not feel uh, inhibited to um, seek their advice. They are trained to work with students who have any type of emotional issue. Yeah. Yeah. So I highly, uh, highly encourage you to go there whenever you think you might need it. And if you just want to have social life or have fun, find Jin Jin and me. Yeah, go <laughs> we, have a drink with these guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we can take over the serious thing, but we can do a lot of other things. Uh, have fun here. Uh, that's the key. I I have another suggestion that you you should try to make full use of the campus resources for fun, like the gym, the mm -hmm. Hawking Center. Oh, the Hawking Center is for field films uh, and concerts and all those kind of stuff and it's some of the shows are free some cost like five dollars or ten dollars it's really cheap and uh like me i oh the gym is free free for all yep. W students yes i think you can sp spend much time in to to like play sports or to work out and uh, you can always find some people with similar habit habits with you. That's a great thing to like release your pressure and make friends. Yep. Yeah. Right. And it's very American going to the gym to work right. out. Right. Yep. Pretty basic <laughs> with Americans. If you're not in the habit yet, you know, it's a great time to start working on those apps. Um, someone else asked how many international students come to Dartmouth. So it depends. The perspective for, from the graduate office is um, about um, that um, uh, about 150 per year. So uh, the incoming international graduate students in 2015, that number is roughly 150. But that does not mean that these are all the new um, international students in town. Um, this number does not include the international people at the med school, and it does not include um, uh, the many, many international people at the Tuck Business School. And uh, then, of course, you're also um, international undergraduate students. So I would say Dartmouth has um, quite a large number of um, international students in, in, in total. There are international postdocs who might be somewhat within, you know, very close to your own age. So they might be in your peer group and you might be hanging out with international postdocs, uh, quite a large communi community of those. So uh, the graduate office is responsible for roughly a thousand students in total and about a third, maybe by now a little bit more of them is international. So let's see, there were, and there was another question, are there any cross-cultural activities organized to help hasten the process of settling in? <laughs> cross-cultural activities, what would you guys say? Um, so for IGMP, we, um, Jinji maybe have the other events as well, but for IGMP, just like what I say, in the following weeks, you will get an email from your mentor, and they are all like your fellow students here, uh, who are more a little bit more senior than you, maybe. Uh, not, I'm not saying the age, but the class. Um, so they will give you a lot of advice. So this will be the time you can do some sort of like cross-cultural kind of like communication and um, um, some sort of like um, help. And so don't hesitate to let your mentor know or like uh, let me know. Uh, or uh, Gilbert, this is another uh, person who is also the um, co-chair in IGMP. So both of us will, um, all of us will help you to settle up here. And after the terms begins, we will have a lot of events. So you just welcome you guys. The, for the first one, there will be maybe more than 100 people coming. And this will be, uh, you can, we, we will have some, um, you can drink some beers. The pizzas, a lot of food, and then you can have a lot of like internet. You can hang out with a lot of international students, also the graduate students here. And also later on, we will set up a lot of like social events for you guys to come, uh, maybe like monthly. Uh, so uh, just keep posted. We'll let you know on Facebook or Twitter or like our website. Okay. Uh, but if you have any question, just email me. You can find my email. Uh, very easy. Okay. 
And I think for the Chinese Student Scholar Association, you guys are not exclusive to Chinese students, right? If I want to go to your New Year celebration, I'm welcome to yeah, of course. celebrate New Year's with you guys. <laughs> yeah, like our biggest event during the year is the Chinese New Year's New Year Gala. Uh, each year there like might be two or three hundred people come to our gala and like uh, there are many uh, students or, or scholars from other countries, they really enjoy like listening to Chinese songs, they enjoy Chinese food. And yeah. also like uh, for the resources uh, of cr uh, cross-culture activities, I think uh, we have uh, many events that held by Jesse, the graduate studies. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you will receive emails like each week for what's going to uh, be held next week, the following week, and you can also uh, visit the Dartmouth website and and type event, and you're gonna show the all all of the events on campus for the following weeks. Yeah, yeah, you can also res research the resources by yourself. Yeah, thanks, Jingjing. Jing. Um, I will just in a second come to more events throughout the year. Um, that are actually that are pretty great, and I wanted to make sure that you're not missing out on them. Uh, there was one important question though. Um, does the gym have a pool? Yes, it does. Yes. Two of them, <laughs> and, and they're pretty free. awesome. And it's free. Yeah, <laughs> and it's free. Well, you know, for you guys, for me, I have to pay a membership fee. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are two pools, and they actually look pretty nice. I think the building is, you know, don't quote me on that, but roughly 100 years old, and they they look quite stylish. It's nice, and you can like uh, if you if you're into lap swimming, that's where the Dartmouth swim team um, uh, has their training, and it's a serious, uh, especially the big one is like a serious swimming pool. Uh, they have a little bit odd hours. Um, I think during term it's something like 10 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then one hour in the evening, and then on the weekend it's like from two to five on Saturdays and Sundays. So the hours are a little bit limited. But um, if you can work around those hours, then um, using that pool is a great option. And there are swim classes as well, in case you're not a swimmer yet. Dartmouth is a great, uh, great place to um, pick up swimming. So I am hoping to share this PowerPoint with you, yes. Um, I call this slide opportunities to learn more about being a graduate student at Dartmouth. I quickly wanted to point out um, some events that will be happening. Some of those might have a little bit of a duplicity um, with today's session. So at some point you will be hearing uh, from me again about um, cultural adaptation and about writing and you will see these guys and talk about IGMP and CSSA again. So. Uh, I apologize in, in advance that um, you, you might not be hearing the end of it. Um, but I think it's better to hear it twice or three times than not to hear it at all. Um, so the first um, event for many of you um, coming to Dartmouth will be a week-long um, experience called Speaking, Writing and Beyond English Bootcamp by Graduate Studies and the Rasas Center. And you will be participating in this if your department feels that your English might need some brushing up. Uh, and I will actually be teaching a couple of sessions during that week. So if you're attending that, uh, then we will have um, a lot of quality time together. And then the graduate office will be hosting a two-day orientation event. Uh, which is the graduate studies orientation on September 14 and 15. And in particular, there will be a two hour session for international graduate students, which um, I am organizing together with a colleague of mine at the graduate office, Jane, Jane Scheibel. And um, at that session, you will have many more opportunities to ask all kinds of questions about um, being a grad student, an international grad student on campus. And you will be seeing these guys again in a podium uh, discussion. Uh, we have some new questions, so let me take a look at that. Um, it gets real cold in, Hano in Hanover. Are the pools mm -hmm. heated? 
Well, yes, they are. <laughs> but it's very cold. You are right. <laughs> you have so it's not like the type of fun therapy pool where you you know hang out with a drink and have like a nice date with your partner. It's for lap swimming. So, um, but that said, if it's uh, minus twenty Celsius outside, then uh, the pool will still be heated. They are not letting it freeze over. Um, let me look at the other things. It might be a challenge challenge uh, if you exit the building in December or January and your hair is still cold, like wet. Like it, that might be a challenge, you know, making yourself go to the pool and then, you know, knowing that you will be freezing afterwards. Um, Pink Dolphin is asking, I am a student coming from the South and have never experienced snow before. Wow, good for you. I'm I mean... jealous already. <laughs> Just wondering how much thick clothing I should bring. And I heard how terrible the winter will get. Uh, Guys, what do we say about that? Should we lie to them? No, no I think, <laughs> yeah, it's true that it's really cold here. But I think about the clothing, uh, you can like bring some with you, but you can also buy here, like yeah. online or go shopping outside. It's cheap. US yes. clothing is really cheap. Right. Like for most of you guys, it will be more expensive in your home country yeah. than going shopping in the States. And there are like nice outlet centers and stuff. Right. So. And there would be a good opportunity to have some fun with your friends here. Yeah. Go shopping. And there are also, you know, if you have to watch your dollar, there are also nice second hand, uh, um, stores. I actually bought some winter gear there. Uh, they're called Listen Stores. So one, for example, is in White River Junction, and they have second-hand clothing. People donate clothes there, and then you pay very little money. And for example, I got a really nice pair of skiing pants for twenty dollars, which in the store would have easily cost one hundred and twenty. Wow. And you know, if if you're into outdoorsy activities, you might not want to buy that stuff new. Um, I have to say, personally, I think that the winter is nice, though. Um, I come from um, a part of Germany where it does get cold, not as cold as here, but then we very rarely have snow. So we have a lot of fog and it's cold and raining in winter and gray, but you don't have like the fun side of um, um, being able to, to ski and sled and all of that. So I actually, skiing is great. I mean, Dartmouth has its own ski way half an hour from here. If you want to do more serious alpine skiing, then 45 minutes from here, Killington and some other areas are great ski resorts. Um, if you're into cross-country skiing or want to pick that up, it's a great workout. It's a lot of fun. And you can do that like literally next door to campus. So um, I actually picked up cross-country skiing. I would hop in my car before going to work, uh, have a five-minute drive, ski through the landscape for like half an hour, and then drive to work. It's, wow. it's, it's great. It's beautiful. And it's a beautiful landscape. So I would say make the best of winter. If, if you have three or four months of continuous snow, uh, that can be a good thing because then the landscape is beautiful and you can do many nice uh, things with that. Um, there was another, oh, how far is the closest shopping mall? Well, if you want to go outlet shopping, like one of these big, big outlet shopping malls, uh, then it is almost a two hour drive, I would say. Yeah, but no, the nearest is, is Merrimack, it's about one, one hour. hour and 15 minutes, maybe one and a half. It, like if my husband is driving, it's two hours, believe me. Oh. <laughs> if everyone else is driving, it's less. Merrimack is a little bit. Closer. Yeah. It's like one, yeah. one, and one hour and maybe half. Yeah. One and a half. And I think like it's that. and I think it's one of the nicest, right? Yeah, right now it's there are the, a couple, the, but in New Hampshire. In New, yeah. New Hampshire. The the biggest thing about New Hampshire is that it's tax free. Yes. So if you want to buy something like without tax, you should just go to the shopping mall here. But if you want to go some like really big shopping mall, you can go Renfen, which is at uh, Boston, yeah. or like go New York. That's the biggest one uh, nearby. It's like four and four to five hour drive but i mean if you have some friends and you have a car you can go there and have fun for the weekend it's good yeah. uh, someone else was asking earlier um how accepting is Hanover towards international students um i cannot speak for the student perspective but i'm obviously an international i have a, a thick german accent 
and I've never encountered xenophobia or anything like that um, in Hanover myself. Um, I think that Americans in general are very open and welcoming. Yeah. And you know, there are a few like a few few exceptions. There are black sheep everywhere, but I would say in general you will feel warmly yeah. welcomed. Yes. Yeah. They are like whoever you get to, they are really friendly and helpful. You can always talk to your American classmates or faculty or anyone you meet in the campus. Yeah. yeah. Even on the street. The right. main street you can you can talk to a lot of people. They are very welcome to talk to you. you can, okay. Sometimes you you can like easy like hear someone's personal story. They like to talk about that <laughs> when you are waiting for your coffee. And that's the thing about American culture, like one of the things that take a little bit of adaptation, but they're, that are actually super cool about the culture is small talk. So you might come from a culture where small talk is not, not a thing. Um, Americans are really good with that. Um, you might want to learn the art of small talk to be, be successful in um, the professional domain, because it doesn't matter if you have a meeting with your PhD advisor or if you're going for a job interview, or if you're just going for coffee at Starbucks, um, people will chat with you about sports, about the weather, about how, how it's hot outside or cold outside, or I really like your glasses. Oh, you have a nice shirt. Why did you buy that? <laughs> and then if you're not used to that, it's like, um, it's considered rude not to engage in, in, in this conversation. Um, but you know, it's an icebreaker. It puts you in a good mood. I mean, who doesn't like to hear that, you know, oh, you like my shirt? Well, <laughs> I bought that at Merrimack. Um, and yeah, so, so small talk, you know, this openness that people have to uh, talk to you about, oh, where you're from, because they hear that you have an accent and immediately, immediately that triggers the question. Um, there might be a follow up uh, where they offer advice. So that's really nice about being here. Um, Rabbit is asking, do we need to buy a car? I think Andy has a very strong opinion on that. <laughs> so, um, depends. So, for me, I bought a car on the second day when I arrived because I already know this place. Even we have some bus here, but if you want to go somewhere to have fun, you need, a, you need to have a car. The metro communication is not great in America in general. And you know that America is really big and the population is really dense. It's not really dense, it's really sparse. Um, so I would say if you have money and you want to have fun, um, if, if you have bought, the main thing is that you, whether you have budget or not, but if you really want to go out and have some different kind of experience, you can have a car. That's my suggestion. But if you don't have, you can find a friend who have a car. Yeah. Do you have a car too, Kim? Yes, I do. Like I, I bought a car. Yes, in the first term, because, uh, but if you live like on campus or not, not far away from campus, you, uh, actually you don't need a car in daily lives. It the Hanover town can meet all your needs, but you live like in other towns like West Lebanon or Lebanon. You, I have to say you need a car because it's really inconvenient to like take a bus every day because it's uh, it's gonna come, uh, it's half an hour or more one hour, hour, more than half or one hour, yeah. yeah, for the bus because you need to wait, right? The, the, so there's yeah. mu much uh, time. Someone is actually way. saying that they find the bus schedule confusing the red line and the blue line and all of that. Yeah, do you have any advice on that, or do you think that they will then clear it out once they're here? Uh, like, yes, yeah, so like you can you visit the website online, you can find those different lines. Uh, I'm not familiar with blue and brown, but when I live in West Lebanon, I took the orange line, and you can uh, also yes, I think the orange line is from Lebanon to Hanover. And the green line is from Lebanon across Vermont to Hanover. And uh, I don't know much about other lines, I, but you can figure it out on website. I, I think it's clear. It's on the website and you will get a hang of it once you're here and you have like a rough idea where the different towns are. Um, like it'll, it'll stick better with you. 
So someone is asking if I do street parking, will it be a nightmare to shovel the car out in the winter? Yes, <laughs> of course, of course it's a nightmare. What do you think? <laughs> it's just, you know, something that you got to deal with. You can um, do some exercise. Yeah, see, here's the psychologist a spinning yeah. it for you in a positive way. To have a positive attitude. But your head is kind of exercise. <laughs> Someone's asking, how should I buy a car? Um, I would say if you're a grad student, ideally a used car, right? Yeah, um, used but there car. is no, there is no wrong or right answer to this. Yeah. There's a lot that. of way. You can find a uh, quick list. Some people will sell their car there and you can go cars.com or like you can go to theaters. There's a lot of theaters around this region. But some people will go to Boston because it's cheaper there. Um, you can drive the, your car back to here without tax because you are living in Hanover. So the key thing is that if you go some other state to buy your car, you need to tell them you are living here mm -hmm. uh, in New Hampshire. You can show them your like billing things or your like um, um, turns with your rent, uh, your, your house, those kind of things, and they can give you tax free for that. So keep in mind for that. But there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, there's no right answer for that. Someone is asking about um, cheap um, garage parking in Hanover. I think the best way of dealing with your car is like making sure that wherever you're living, you can park your car there, right? What yeah. about mm -hmm. North Park? Can students have a car in North Park? Uh, yes, yes, but they, they have pay. to pay. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, if you pay for the parking lot, then you get a parking yes. lot, right? So I think that is probably the best way. If you have North Park accom accommodation the first year that you're here, then just make sure that you're um, paying for a parking lot and park the car there. Um, I actually promised you a couple of um, slides, and you should already be seeing the slide, the first slide by now, on fun things that, it, that you can do at Dartmouth throughout the year. And I wanted to point them out because if you're not familiar with the American university system, you might not know what to look out for, for Americans, it is clear that at some point in the year there is homecoming and then there is reunion and of course there is this and that. But if those terms don't mean anything to you, you might easily miss those big, big events. So um, October 9 and 10, there will be homecoming weekend, which is a huge extravaganza of different parties and events. And the big thing every year is the bonfire, which you can see here on um, uh, on this picture, it's on the green, they light a huge fire, and then the first year undergrad students run around that fire for like two hours. It's their crazy choice. Um, but it's beautiful just to go there, hang out, watch the fire yeah. burn. Um, it's quite nice. Then every year uh, in, I would say, January, February, I don't know exactly when the next one is going to be, there is a winter carnival and Ockham Pond party. Um, so Winter Carnival is a party that Dartmouth hosts every year. It has many fun events, um, an ice, ice sculpting competition and a human sled race and you name it. And they have um, a fun snow sculpture on um, the green every year. And then on the right picture you see the polar bear plunge where you can actually, if you're up for that, maybe the person who asked about whether the pool is heated might not, but everyone else might be willing to jump into uh, the frozen pond. Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite safe, like they have a whole setup there to make sure that you don't die. Um, Dartmouth reunion, uh, sometime in June, they have reunion, which means that Dartmouth alums come back to Dartmouth and have a lot of nice events, which you can also benefit from because, for example, there is a big um, nice um, free concert on the green with fireworks and all of that, so don't miss out on that. And then this is an event which is not exactly Dartmouth, but it happens in Hanover and it's just cute and fun. Um, there is the July 4 parade, um, which goes through town and um, across the green, and they have some fun events on the green. And then in the evening, you can go to multiple locations to watch fireworks in Lebanon or in Wilder or in other places and celebrate the American national holiday. Um, do you guys have any questions on that? No? Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the campus in general, and then also uh, familiar familiarizing yourself with uh, American higher education, if you're interested in that. 
so there was the lag, but I think now we're good to go. So um, let me walk you through a couple of um, tabs on my browser real quick. What you see here is an interactive map um, of Dartmouth. So if you um, look for um, any office um, at Dartmouth, you can type in the name or the address and it will show up on the interactive map. So just Google um, mobile map Dartmouth and it will come up and it's a lifesaver. Um, and by the way, I will be after the meeting sometime today, not right after the meeting. Sorry, now this is Jenna talking. We will make her stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is pretty cool. So this is actually, so yeah, I was about to say, I will send an email with the links to all of these. So don't take your pen and pencil and you know, a pen and paper and uh, start writing down the links. So you will receive an email with um, links to um, all of these websites. So that's an interactive campus tour where you can literally walk across Dartmouth campus. Um, I would encourage you to familiarize yourselves. Could you switch to the presentation mode? Unable to see, see the presentation. Okay, why are people not seeing the presentation? That is so weird. Can people see the presentation now? Yes, thank you. Okay, we're good. So just in case you didn't see that, this is uh, the mobile map that I was talking about. This is uh, the interactive campus tour. Um, I will send a link to two commencement speeches, which I think uh, like very nicely represent um, um, American um, higher education culture. Um, and since they both took place at Dartmouth, they will also um, get you in the feel for Dartmouth. Conan O'Brien is a very famous um, TV host in the US and she came to Dartmouth in 2011 to give a speech at uh, the graduation ceremony. Those graduation ceremonies in the, in the US, I'm sure you have seen them in a movie at some point. They're really big and really cool. Uh, thousands and thousands of people and people graduating have these long black robes and a hat and eventually they throw the hat and that's when they get the diploma. And it's a big event. And um, the, the tradition of the commencement speech is quite something. Standing presidents usually go to some university and um, give commencement addresses there. So I encourage you to watch the one given by Conan O'Brien and then the one from this year, I attended myself and it was, was very interesting and very entertaining and funny by David Brooks. Um, if you wanna know what it is like to um, graduate from um, Dartmouth as a grad student, you will actually have um, the chance to watch a video here about uh, the first ever graduation ceremony of um, um, the graduate office. Um, this is a video that I've produced uh, with, a help, with the help from a colleague at the graduate office about um, my own work. So if you wanna learn more about what it's like to have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me and to work on your writing and uh, presentation skills, um, do watch this video. Um, and then I would like to come to um, what can I actually do to prepare myself, uh, myself for um, the challenge of being a student in the U.S. and present in class, give talks in conferences, at conferences or in the classroom. And if you haven't been doing that already, get in the habit of watching a TED talk every now and then. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I think that really communicates well how Americans like to give public talks. And this, these are really good examples of good public speaking. Um, and you can learn a lot from that. Um, if you want to um, learn something about American higher education in general, especially if you're thinking about maybe becoming a professor in this country, there are two newspapers that you can also read online. One is the Chronicle of Higher Education, which I would say is the leading newspaper in the field dealing with issues in higher education. And then the other one is called Inside Higher Ed. And they're both excellent places 
where you can read up on higher education in the country. And then, of course, Dartmouth has its own student-run newspaper called the Dartmouth. And if you have time in the next couple of weeks, that is also something that you might want to look at already. Okay. Let's see if we can go to the next slide without too much of a lag. So as promised, I wanted to say a couple of words about uh, writing support at Dartmouth. Um, if you want to um, work on your writing and communication skills, um, chances are it's a good idea to do that if you're an international student. Um, even if you're from India or some country where English is spoken a lot or you have attended um, an international school and were taught in English, uh, that puts you at a great advantage. But uh, please realize that the American way of writing and giving talks is so different from anywhere else in the world. So even if, for example, you're Indian, there will be quite an adjustment to writing for an American audience and giving a talk for an American audience. Um, so I would encourage you to consider taking a writing class. There are upper level writing classes like the art of science writing, scientific writing and communication in the life sciences or science and technology writing and presentation, which are routinely offered. A great way of prepping for uh, conference presentations is the annual Dartmouth graduate student poster session. And it comes with a workshop a couple of days before that that helps you prepare for it. Um, so you can go to that workshop. It's usually like 90 minutes long, I guess. Um, it's called Three Minute Research Presentation, and there you can practice your poster presentation and you know just stand next to your poster and chat with your audience about um, what your research is like. I am also planning to offer a mini course, which will be four or five weeks long, in fall term on academic communication, uh, so writing and presentation skills probably for international graduate students, which um, I think it's great to have this um, special focus on international students because we will look at certain issues that um, domestic students or like native speaker students might not really run into, but that you guys might have difficulty with. And then there is always uh, the option of having one-on-one -on -one sessions with me and look at your drafts and your presentations together. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about three books that I think are great handbooks on writing. Uh, I'm doing this now because I'm, I'm thinking um, if any of you want to um, prep for being a grad student in the U.S. right now, say, you know, I assume that all of you are busy studying or working or whatever you're doing. But if you're saying, hey, you know, over the weekend or in the evening, I already want to do something to prepare myself for the experience, I think reading a good book on, on writing doesn't hurt because all of you will have to do it. It doesn't matter if you're a computer science master student or a PhD student in chemistry, all of you will have to give talks and all of you will have to write essays and scientific papers and eventually a capstone thesis or master thesis or PhD thesis. So no matter who you are and what kind of program you will get yourself into, you will have to write in English and for an American audience. Um, irrespective of the discipline, um, this uh, third book from the list, um, Style, The Basics of Clarity and Grace, it's a, it's a great starting point. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you're from the humanities, social sciences, or um, from the sciences. It's a great book on how to write for an American readership. Um, if you're a science student, then um, this book by Hilary Gladman Deal is a great choice to prep you for a master thesis or a PhD thesis in the sciences. And then this book I've actually used a lot in a grammar workshop series, grammar workshop series that I've recently taught. Um, Academic Writing for Graduate Students, Essential Tasks and Skills. Um, it is a combination of telling you how to structure and write a thesis, um, what you should be doing stylistically, um, but also, uh, it also covers grammar points, so it really helps you brush up on, on your grammar, so it's a nice mix. Um, and if you come to my office, we can talk more about which book might be a good 
starting point um, for uh, for your own needs. And I will, of course, also in the email, I will include the titles of these books so that you also have them. Um, let me look at what else you might need. So there will, will be one more session that I wanted to point out at the beginning of um, your Dartmouth experience. Um, this will happen in the second week of term. It's a one hour session with a librarian for international graduate students. It will be called Research Resources and References, Information Management for International Graduate Students in the Sciences. You can already sign up for that um, on the graduate studies calendar, just the same way that you signed up for today's um, web conference. And this session um, will help you familiarize yourself with doing research in um, uh, a US setting, uh, learning about databases, learning about um, how to set up, set up your v VPN account, and how to make use of the library in a way that benefits the most, um, that you can benefit the most from. Do you guys have any questions about this so far? So I highly, highly encourage you to sign up for one of these two sessions because either one can only host 20 international students because um, every student will be sitting at their own computer, uh, computer um, station in the special room in the library and it's um, very nicely equipped. But the downside is that we have to limit um, the number of students. Um, there is one question, let me quickly have a look at it. Is the session only for the sciences or the arts as well? That's a good question. It will be uh, predominantly for scientists. So if I assume you might be a math student, math or comparative literature, many of the things that will be uh, mentioned will not apply to you, but many, many other things will. So I would say feel free to come, but don't be frustrated about the occasional um, science reference. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Um, just basically any question about academic life or social life, practical issues when coming to Dartmouth and coming to Hanover. So I would really like to open up the floor and um, give you a chance to ask anything that you haven't been able to ask until now. No? Okay. Okay, so it's a good sign. Yeah, it's well. <laughs> now the questions are coming in. So the first one is, how do you guys eat food, cooking or eat out? <laughs> um, good question. That's a great question. Okay, we'll do this for another half hour then. <laughs> like uh, most graduate students, uh, as far as I know, like if you like like American food, you can always find find the food on campus. Uh, all in a town, but if like me, I prefer Chinese traditional food. That, uh, although we have restaurant in a town, but there are only one or two. Yeah. Better for um, it's a little bit expensive, but so I like always cook at home. What about you, Andy? So. <laughs> With times, you will change. I will say that. Um, when I first arrived here, I usually cook a lot, and then I gradually become lazy and I go out. But right now, I come back again because I'm tired about all the food here already, even the Chinese food. So I cook it a lot as well. But you know, like um, on on the main street, there's a couple options: one Thai food and uh, one Korean. Japanese. One Chinese, yeah, Korean, Japanese. Yeah. And, two Thai, uh, actually. They're finding it out at the okay. moment. Right. Wow. There's a yeah. new Thai restaurant. Really? Yeah. Wow, yeah. I don't know that. You In the that former, I... what is it, three guys basement. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. And then a lot of like a, a good um, American um, food place. So I would say like, don't worry about too much about it. And you will be very easy to go like a uh, price shopper or the supermarket to buy food or like um, Yiping, which is a very small uh, Asian food um, market, Asian market, yeah. Asian market. But you, you can find this information later. Yeah. Um, don't worry about it. Um, just come and enjoy. So there are great dining options on campus. And the big one is called 
1953 commons and um, older older people on campus they call 1953 commons Thayer Hall because that's what it used to be called and undergrads call it the FOCO which stands for food court so if people you know that is just to avoid ambiguity it has three different names and uh, you pay a fixed fixed price and it's and it's a great option I actually have lunch there like six or seven times a week um, starting starting this fall um, graduate students will get access to the faculty and staff meal plan which may which will make it much more affordable to you than to previous generations of graduate students at Dartmouth um, I take a lot of pride in having helped to arrange for that so if you ever want to thank someone for that wow. um, <laughs> it's I think you know I'm a fan of that place I think they have great healthy choices and even greater unhealthy choices and <laughs> Um, it's just nice to have all you can eat and it's a nice environment and why sh why shouldn't you eat there? Uh, Jing Jing pointed out right next to it there is a place called Collis and they have sushi and stir fried noodles and all kinds of other play uh, things that are also great for takeout. So there are many good options um, on Arthur. the campus. There is King Arthur flour if you want to grab yes, some coffee, coffee and a sandwich. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, other places that are a little bit more hidden, like the Tuck School of Business has its own cafeteria where you can just go and pay with cash. And uh, in the hop, there is another cafeteria. So there are quite a couple of dining options on campus as well. Um, someone is asking about the books that are recommended. Um, um, is there a way I can rent them from libraries now or is there any place to print out something? Um, it depends on which countries your country you're in at the moment. Just check on your local um, Amazon or whatever the equivalent is. None of these books is really expensive. Um, like I would say, at least in the States, I don't know about this one, but these two are less than $25. Um, I will not officially recommend going online and looking for illegal versions online. I cannot recommend that. Um, but other than that, if you come to Dartmouth, um, you will be able to get books like this from the library if they, they are currently um, on loan. If someone else has them, then there is interlibrary loan. That said, um, a book like this one, for example, is great just to own because it also has many great vocabulary lists that you might just want to have a chance to um, look them up while you're writing your thesis. So it's not the type of book that you read once and then abandon, but you might actually have that book and use it throughout your, your master's or PhD career. Um, more questions coming in. What is the typical lending period for the library or is the library only meant for referencing? No, you can get books from there, but how much is the period typically to get a book from the library for students? You mean how much? How, or much? how, how, how long? How long, oh, oh. you know, oh, how many weeks can you take the book? No, More it depends. Than too long. Yeah, it oh, depends. It depends. I um, think it depends on whether there's a new one or the old one, right? Uh, no, like... Uh, I don't, there are uh, many libraries in, on campus, but w I often go to the Baker Barry Library, which is also the biggest one, and I always like uh, read books from library. Uh, you, you firstly should search online if it's available in Baker. So if the book is available in our own library, you can borrow it and you can hold about three months. Mm -hmm. But if it's not available uh, in the in our library, you can also borrow by borrow direct or yep. dart doc. Like I always use borrow direct, and that means you can borrow books from other Ivy League universities. You can own about two months, but you can always renew online. You can renew twice, uh, like as I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so what about the books in the science department? I. So I borrowed a lot of book in the first year, but after that, no, no because I always read it online. So um, I would say maybe just the same as Jinjin said, like, but I uh, direct borrow direct or direct borrow. Which borrow direct. Borrow direct is a very good um, resource for that because like if you can find a book here, you can still borrow from 
other IB uh, League plays, they usually have this book and yeah. you can hold it for like, you can also renew it. So you like, if you renew once, it would, you can have four months. If you twice, then this will be half a year, right? Right. Yeah. And if you really ever have any difficulty finding a rare book, um, and then it's even not available through uh, one of these interlibrary loan services, just go to a librarian and talk to them. If you go to the um, Bakerberry library website and look at the list of librarians, it's mind blowing how many people work in the library and who are a resource for you. So uh, depending on what subject, there are different subject librarians. There's one for English, one for chemistry, one for math, and, um, and so on and so forth. So you can just um, go see that person and have a chat with them about that, or just in general, go to the help desk and have them help you find a book. In general, being at Dartmouth, you should have that um, a kind of demanding attitude that if you need a book for your research, they should help you get it. Right. Yeah, I think that's the expectation that you can have. Yeah. Um, so someone is asking about the faculty meal plan. Um, um, who can join? Well, all graduate students, no exceptions. And where can I get more details about it? So we will have more details about it ready for you guys at um, the graduate orientation on September 14 and 15. The head of dining services will actually come to that orientation session and talk about the meal plan. Um, and then you will be able to join the meal plan um, in the card office, um, which is where you will get your student ID. It's in the same building as 1953 Commons, actually. Um, you will have to commit to either 10 lunches or 10 dinners or 10 breakfasts. Or if, if you want to do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then all of that, and you will have a full academic year to, um, to, to use those. Um, so it's a commitment of saying, okay, I know that I will be eating in 1953 um, for 10 lunches, and then you're putting down the money and you get it at a, um, a reduced rate. Um, Someone is asking, do American students in general do better than international students in academics? Uh, I don't know. I think they might do better in art. I think because like for in most international students, the one of the biggest problem is writing. Yes. Like even though you have good ideas, a uh, good structure of your paper, but your like you have your writing is poor. The professor will still give you a lower grade, what uh, comparing to those American students. But if you if you don't have problems with writing, I think there is not. I think they won't judge the students by their mm -hmm. countries. Yeah. So. The key thing about Americana culture, uh, uh, culture is that they appreciate people who work hard and also work well. So you can see a lot of like international come here and they stay here, which means we can all success in this country. Yeah. So don't feel bad. Like maybe at the beginning, you won't be too easy to get involved in their conversation, but it takes time, but like after two years or something like that, you will get used to their style. And you are not, you are not stupid, you, you are not like stupid. And then you are just like, we, we all like the same. Maybe like at the beginning, they will talk more. They, they seem more, they seem smarter than you, but it doesn't mean that it's the truth. So just take time and get used to what they usually express and try to use the same way as they express to impress the people and people will kind of like admire you and respect you uh, at the end. So I would say we can all um, success in this um, American yeah. culture. This is a good thing about American culture that they are very open and they appreciate people who work out. Yeah, and traditionally America is a place, uh, it's an immigration country. It's a place where foreigners come and work hard and, you know, um, strive for happiness and then eventually um, uh, um, get what they want. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the American dream. So um, in this way, it's an, it's an open, welcoming culture. And when you look at who works at Dartmouth, you will see, as I said, a lot of international postdocs. And you will actually see a surprising number of um, foreign names among uh, the faculty. Yeah. 
And I think that's a very good sign for you that, you know, other people made it before you and Dartmouth is also really striving to increase its diversity, just like any other um, um, university in the country is currently, you know, that's a very heavy focus for them. If you read the Chronicle of Higher Education or Inside Higher Ed, you will see um, um, a lot of debate going on about diversity and inclusivity and um, helping women, helping people of color, including different ethnicities and, you know, all of that. So I think it's also a great opportunity to come here um, at a time when American academia is very aware of the need to diversify. Um, someone is asking, how is the uh, balance between social life and workload? I've heard Dartmouth has a very high workload. Right, that's true. But uh, for me, like uh, as a graduate student, as a math student, we always have a lot of readings, papers, presentations to finish. But what I do to balance the social life and the, the study is that to try to finish the your homework in time. Uh, don't like don't always try to finish it bef just be right before the deadline. And then you can. Uh, another thing to mention is it's better to schedule your time like by which day you will finish this homework and by which day you will for another. And you can always find a period, a free time for you to relax. Then you can invite your friends to let's do something on that. Do you have time on that day? Let's go hiking, go for a movie. And, uh, but if like you like in the final times you really really don't have that period, you can you can still like find your own uh, ways to relax. I I go to the gym, listen to music, and also like cook some meals with my friends to my home. That don't uh, take much time. It's about one, two hour thing, but that helps. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really important that you mentioned time management. I think uh, this is a major shift coming from uh, college, coming from your undergraduate experience that um, at least in, in for most of you, in most countries, most cultures, um, you were usually told what to do when. Right, very structured, very much like a school system. Your professor told you now do this, now do that. We expect you to handle these things to be successful. And then you do all of that. You're like working hard and super busy. And then in the end, you have good grades and uh, you get accepted to Dartmouth. That's the story so far. But once you're a master's student, and especially once you're a PhD student, um, you're in charge. You're in charge of your own education and you cannot expect everyone to keep telling you I need you to do this by then. Sometimes these expectations might not be voiced explicitly. Sometimes it might be over a very long course of time. You know, in the most extreme of cases, it's okay, you've done your qualifying exams after two years of coursework. Well, after three years of lab research, we need you to hand in a PhD thesis. And there might be very little guidance um, during those three years. So you kind of have to set your own goals. You, part of the experience is to identify what you need to do and when you need to do it and how much time you have to invest into this task and how much time you have to invest into that task. And then it's your responsibility to also work on the uh, work-life balance and make sure that you know you work out and you eat healthy yeah. and you have a good social life yeah. and all of that. And that can be a challenge if you're used to a system that tells you all the time what you should be doing when. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, look at it as, as a great opportunity and not as a threat. You know, you're finally being treated like, like an adult, like a grown-up person, and you can actually decide what is important for your own research, what is important for your own education. If you want to take an additional class on writing or communication or something else, if you want to tool up on a computer program, then, you know, you might do that in your own time and learn that programming language and just have that personal drive behind it. And it's like uh, graduate school is a great place to um, identify what your goals are and going for those goals. So really look at it as an opportunity, but also know that especially in the American culture, um, on top of this being grad school, um, 
Americans will be more hesitant to tell you what you, to do than um, professors or advisors in many other countries, right? Yep. So they will look at you more on an eye to eye level or, you know, your professor might expect you to tell them what you think you need to be doing. So don't come with that expectation um, of, you know, my PhD advisor will tell me what to do and in the end I will have, you know, um, I will have written a PhD thesis. I don't think that this is a good approach. Right. It is. Yeah. Okay, let's look. I don't think that any that there are any more questions. And we should probably leave it at that because I promised an hour long session and we've already done an hour 20, which I think is great. Um, I think this was a huge success. Thank you so much, people, for asking all these amazing questions. I hope that you're bringing many more questions to international orientation because we'll, we will have a setup in which you will also participate um, at the and ask more of your questions in that setting. And um, in the meantime, if you need uh, to know something, please be on me. I will actually share my screen with you one last time. Um, sorry, I will have to mute someone real quick. Someone is actually uh, their audio. Okay, here we go. Um, so feel free to email me with your questions. Um, you will receive an email with all the great links and all the great input about um, the books and so on and so forth. Um, I will also send you a brief survey um, how you like the session and what you would improve about it. Please uh, reply to the survey. It will only take a moment to reply to that. I promise it will be less than five minutes for sure. And it will really help me to um, offer this again in the future. Um, this was the first time ever that we hosted something like this at the graduate office. And I think it's a good idea to get in touch with you guys before you actually come to Dartmouth. Um, if you think the same, please let us know. If you think that it was a waste of your time, please also let us know. Uh, I'll make sure to anonymize the survey the same way as this thing was anonymized. And if you have any feedback how we can improve the session in the future, um, that will help me um, improve the service for future generations. Um, Ching Ching, Andy, thank you so much for coming, thank for you. volunteering thank your you. time thank you. Thank and sharing you. all your great uh, uh, input with our future students. And see you here in fall. Have a great summer. Bye. Bye. Bye.